very quickly, I want you to be finding 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're, uh, during these days, making our way through uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, living in anticipation of His return, is uh, the title of our series, Living in Anticipation of His Return. We already, in chapter 1, we have seen an example of uh, the model church. We've seen what the Apostle Paul has to say about the work of faith. And tonight, in verses 1 through 12 of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2, we're going to see the ministry model exemplified by Paul. The ministry model exemplified by Paul. Stand with me as we honor the reading of God's inspired word. Verse number 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know. At Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and com comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom, and his glory. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. The ministry model exemplified by Paul. I was reading this week about a young pastor who had just announced to his congregation that he was leaving because he had felt it was God's will to accept another call to a new field. After the service, he was standing there at the door and greeting people when one of the elderly saints approached him with tears streaming down her face. And as she talked to him, she was just sobbing, and she said, Oh, Pastor, I am so sorry you've decided to leave. Things will never be the same again. And of course, the young preacher was flattered, but he was equal to the opportunity, and so he took her hands in his hands, and he replied, Most graciously, bless you, sister, but I'm sure that God will send you a new pastor even better than I. She choked back a sob and she said, that's what they all say, but preacher, they keep getting worse and worse. <laughs> now listen, really Paul is talking about his job or his calling as a minister. So we're going to walk through this together and, and uh, see what the Word of God teaches. But being an under-shepherd of the flock is not always easy for ministers. It has been estimated, Sammy, you said something about this in deacons meeting uh, last month. It's been estimated that in some denominations are some denominations that over 50 pastors a week resign under pressure. Over 50 weeks. Now, as we have seen, chapter 1 of this letter focuses on how the church of Thessalonica was born, but chapter 2 is going to focus or center on how it was nurtured. In chapter 1, Paul is the evangelist. But in chapter 2, Paul is the pastor. You see, a minister must be faithful to preach, and then he ought to get about being a faithful pastor to his congregation. Amen? In the opening verses of chapter 3, here's what we find. We find Paul exemplifying for us uh, 
A model ministry or a ministry model. You see, the Apostle Paul was a faithful shepherd. And while there is no doubt that Paul is here defending himself from some, some of the criticisms there in the community that had arisen after his departure from Thessalonica, there still emerges in this passage a wonderful picture of the work of a good shepherd of Jesus Christ. You see, in our text... Paul models for pastors, he models for elders how to conduct themselves in the local church. But listen to me, there is also an example for believers here and how they should live for God in a hostile world. In our text, Paul is reminding these young believers of the kind of ministry he had as he taught and as he cared for all of the new believers there at the church at Thessalonica. He cared for this young church. So there are three pictures that I want you to see here in our text tonight. The first picture is this. I see a steward that is faithful. A steward that is faithful is found there in verses 1 through 4. But I want you to take note, especially of verse 4. He, he says, Knowing, brethren beloved, or excuse me, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Paul had been entrusted with the gospel. Paul had not made up, Paul had not conjured up this message. Paul viewed himself as a steward of the message of God. Now you know what a steward is. It's a person who owns nothing but possesses and uses everything that belongs to his master. A great example of that is Joseph there in the Old Testament. Joseph was a faithful steward in the house of Potiphar. He was entrusted with Potiphar's home and with his business. He took care of Potiphar's house. He used all the master's resources to take care of his possessions. He managed his master's affairs and used all of his master's goods to promote his master's welfare. Paul says the gospel is a treasure that has been entrusted to every believer. Now I wonder tonight. Do we understand that when we receive the gospel that we take on a sacred responsibility? Now listen what that responsibility is. Our responsibility as believers is to make sure that the gospel is passed on to others in this world. We can't hide it under a bushel and we cannot bury it. We are to invest it so that it will multiply and produce spiritual dividends to God's glory. You remember what Paul said? Paul said, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You see, a steward may not be popular in man's eyes, but we better not be unfaithful in God's eyes. Amen? In verse 4, Paul basically says that the believer who plays to the grandstand and the preacher who plays to the crowd will lose God's reward. In Luke chapter 16, in verse 1, Bible says, not as pleasing men, but God. Friend, listen to me. The most important thing for us as Christians, the most important thing for me as a pastor, the most important thing for all of us as stewards of the gospel is for us to please the Lord. Amen? Enoch, it was said of him in the Old Testament, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. I wonder tonight, is, is it your ultimate goal in the Christian life? All of your preaching, all of your teaching, all of your singing, all of your testifying, all your visiting, is it your goal just to please God? Pleasing God, that was Paul's objective. He was, objective. He was a faithful steward. Now I want you to notice something about a faithful steward. I want you to notice several marks of a faithful steward. First of all, a faithful steward, his manner is bold. His manner is bold. In chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul is talking about his triumphs as an evangelist. But in verse 2, he talks about his trials as an evangelist. You know what? Paul paid a price for preaching the gospel. Say that fast five times. <laughs> Paul paid a price for preaching the gospel. He had suffered physically, and listen to me, he had suffered emotionally. The Bible says he was shamefully entreated. That refers to the emotional abuse that Paul took. William MacDonald said this. 
He said a less robust person would have thought of numerous theological reasons as to why God was calling him to some more congenial audiences. Not Paul. You see, despite all that he had endured at Philippi, he moves on to Thessalonica. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of us have not had to suffer a lot for the Lord. Amen? We've not had to pay the price yet that some of God's people have paid. I mean, sure, it rains sometimes on Sunday, and we have to get out of our car and get a little wet as we're walking in. Sometimes, sure, we have a headache while we're trying to teach Sunday school or sing in the choir. But have we really paid a price for serving the Lord? Uh, young people, have you ever really paid a price for standing up for the Lord at your school? Uh, are you actually standing for Him? Young people, if I could encourage you tonight, and this is just a sidebar, could I encourage you tonight to be very careful what you post on social media? You know, there are a lot of people looking around social media. Even your pastor from time to time looks around social media. And you know, sometimes I see uh, uh, young people saying things that they shouldn't be saying. I, I see some things on Instagram. And it, adults, this goes for you too. I see some things on Instagram that I, I really don't think I should see. I see some things on Twitter that I don't think that I ought to see. Just be very careful what you do on social media. Based on your vocabulary and how you act at school, sometimes it appears that maybe you just do act when you come to the house of God on Sunday. Now listen to me, whenever the opportunity arises for us to complain and murmur, we need to take a look at our hands and see if there are any scars for Christ there. Uh, let's check and see if there are stripes on our back because we've been beaten for Christ's sake. You see, Paul suffered, but his suffering did not stop him from serving. Amen? His manner is bold, but listen to me. Uh, the other mark of a steward is this. His message is very clear. His message is very clear. For our, verse 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. Now, Paul is not speaking here about one message in particular that he had preached. Paul, I'm sure like most preachers, he had his moments of joy and he had his moments of discouragement. Matter of fact, I read about a preacher who was having a struggle one day. He was a street preacher. He was out there on the street and he was uh, trying to preach, but he was just having a struggle. And an old drunk came up to him and put his hand on his shoulder and said, Preacher, some days you just don't have it, do you? <laughs> I can relate to that, amen? Listen, Paul is speaking here not about just one message in particular that he preached. Paul is speaking here of the entirety of his ministry. He uses that word deceit in verse 3. That means error. Now, Paul's ministry certainly was not perfect. However, his message was without error. Paul never deviated from the gospel, and he did not put up with those who did. Since he had met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul remained on course with the gospel, and he never would he dilute his message to accommodate his listeners. Now, listen to me. Just as there are in our day, there was in Paul's day those who used the gospel as a means for making money. So when Paul came to this city, there were those who attacked his, mo attacked his motives. Uh, some said he ran away, he hasn't been seen or heard of since. Paul's just in it for what he can get out of it. He doesn't care about you, you new converts at the Thessalonica. He's more concerned about his own skin and his own welfare. Which leads me to the third mark of a steward, and it's this. His motives are pristine. His motives are pristine. The third mark of a steward is the purity of his motives. Notice uh, that word uncleanness in verse 3. It means impure motives. Look at verse number 5. Uh, the Bible says in verse 5, For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. You see, Paul had not buttered them up to take advantage of them. Uh, somebody, and Paul talks about flattering words, somebody has defined the difference between flattery and gossip. He, here's the difference between flattery and gossip. Flattery is what we say to someone's face that we would never say behind their back. And gossip is what we say behind someone's back that we would never say to their face. That's a pretty good definition, amen? 
When you flatter, you're just telling somebody what you think they want to hear in order to sway them to do something that you want them to do. You know what that is? That's manipulation, amen? Now listen, we all like flattery. We all like flattery. Sometimes we like, to, like for folks to tell us how good we are, amen? We just like it. It's human nature. I was reading about a new pastor who had just preached his first message. And folks were coming to him from the congregation and they were saying, what a wonderful message that was, Pastor. Finally, this man came up to him and said, Preacher, that's the worst sermon I've ever heard. And then he said, who told you you could preach anyway? Uh, why, if you're a preacher, then I'm the President of the United States. And one of the deacons were standing over there watching and he could see that the new pastor was upset. So he came over and put his arm around the new minister and he said this. He said, don't worry what that man has to say. He just repeats what everybody else is thinking. <laughs> now always remember this about flattery. Flattery is like perfume. It's all right to smell it, but don't swallow it. Amen? Uh, are you serving Christ with pure motives? Or, or are we serving Him to advance our own interest? Are we serving Him to exalt our ego or to extend our own prestige? His motives are pristine. Uh, but fourth of all, here's the fourth mark of a steward. His method is true. His method is true. That word guile means to bait a fish by deceit. Now here's what I know about fishing. I have never met one fish who was dumb enough just to jump on a hook. Amen? you got to trick him. You have to cover that hook uh, with bait. And that fish thinks that he's going to get a good lunch when he sees that bait, but actually he's going to be a good lunch. Amen? He goes for the bait and you've got him. Now there were those who were saying that's what Paul was doing. They said he is tricking people into being saved. But Paul says down in verse 10 that spiritual witnessing and Christian salesmanship are quite different. Listen, salvation does not lie at the end of a clever, clever argument or a subtle presentation. It's the result of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now I've heard people say, I don't care what your method is just as long as your message is right. Listen, there are some methods that are unworthy of the gospel. They're cheap. The gospel is a costly message that required the death of God's Son. Some methods are worldly. Some are man-centered, whereas the gospel is a divine message and is centered in God's glory. Amen? So the first picture is, a steward, is of a steward that is faithful. But the second picture of the ministry model of the Apostle Paul is this. The picture is a, of a mother that is helpful. A mother that is helpful. A steward is faithful, but a mother is gentle. As an apostle, Paul was a man of authority. But listen, he always used that authority in love. The new believers at Thessalonica, they could sense his tender loving care as he nurtured them. He was like a loving mother who cared for her, for her children. Notice with me the care of the ministry in verse number 7. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. That word nurse speaks of a nursing mother. Cherisheth means to warm. It's used uh, of the way a mother bird covers her young. It's the picture of the mother warming the little birds in the nest. Have you ever just watched a, a mama with her brand new baby? Uh, just watch a mother with her brand new baby. She nourishes that baby. She cuddles that baby. She kisses that baby. She hugs that baby. She loves that baby. Is there anything sweeter in the world than the tenderness of a mother with her children? I believe that is the kind of heart that God puts into a truly God-called pastor. Amen? Now listen, when I was young, Brother Sammy, I was a hotshot preacher in my own mind. But I look back and I say, boy, I said some dumb things as a young preacher. Just dumb. Plain out dumb. Now, you don't have to agree with that, okay? I still do say some dumb things on occasion. 
But listen, more than anything else, this is the kind of pastor and spiritual leader that I want to be. I want to nourish you and love you and care for you. You see, we're living in a day when people have a great deal of strain. They have a great deal of pressure on them. It's difficult for people to make it day by day in our culture. That's why I want to encourage you in the things of God. I want to tell everybody here this evening, afresh and anew, that the Lord loves you. Amen? If you're in Jesus Christ, you are going to make it. You are precious in His sight. His eye is on you. He has numbered the hairs on your head. A ministry of care. Now, would you be described as a caring believer? Would we be described as a caring church family? Does caring, is it a, a word that our, uh, especially our ministry to one another, especially to those who are young in the faith, does it mark our ministry here at Blue Ridge View? The care of the ministry. But notice the cost of the ministry. Notice verse number 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, here it is, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. You know what the old-timey preachers used to say? They would say, brethren, I have delivered my soul. Paul says our own souls. You know what? I like to hear a man preach the gospel who has his soul into it. Amen? I like to hear a man preach the gospel who believes what he preaches. Listen, it costs to care. Paul did not hand his converts over to babysitters. He made sacrifices. He cared for them personally. The hymn Onward Christian Soldiers was written uh, by a man named Sabine Baring Gould. He was the father of 16 children, and sometimes he had difficulty in remembering their names. As a matter of fact, at a Christmas party one time, he asked a sweet, pretty little girl, he says, and little lady, whose girl are you, my dear? And the little girl burst into tears and replied, I'm yours, Daddy. Now listen to me, Paul didn't have that problem. Paul was out there with the new converts. He was nourishing them. He was feeding them. He was protecting them. Uh, you say, it's not easy being a nursing mother. You're exactly right. Even Moses felt the burden of caring for God's people. Moses made this statement. He said, wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? that thou layest the burden of all this people on me. I can identify with that sometimes. Can you? Listen, it's our job as mature believers to nurse new believers on the milk of the Word if we ever expect them to graduate to the meat of the Word. Amen? Then there's a third picture. A third picture of the ministry model of the Apostle Paul is this. A father that is responsible. A father that is responsible. Paul considered himself a spiritual father to the believers at Thessalonica, just as he, just as he did toward the saints at Corinth. Here's what he said to the saints at Corinth. He said, Though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. You see, any father worth his salt not only begets children, he cares for them. Amen? Notice how Paul cares for and nurtures these new believers at Thessalonica. First of all, Paul speaks about his endurance. Look at verse 9. For ye remember, a father works to support his family. And the apostle Paul knew the meaning of hard work. Every Jewish boy had to learn a trade. And Paul's trade was tent making. Rather than take offerings from his new converts... Paul worked long hours to support himself. He made tents by day. He ministered the word by night. You know, it didn't take me long uh, to realize that in the ministry, there really are no office hours. The ministry, for all those who are involved in it, not just the preacher, but the Sunday school teacher, the soul winner, those that serve, it sometimes can be very, very taxing. Matter of fact, don't even consider the Lord's work. Don't even consider service to Him unless you are prepared to work hard. Amen? Notice what Paul says. He says, he talks about laboring night and day. For you remember, verse number 9, brethren, our labor and travail. Laboring night and day. Christian, do you ever put yourself out? 
in order that you might share the gospel with others? Do we ever sacrifice anything that might be a blessing to other believers? Uh, but notice a second thing. Not only his endurance, but Paul speaks about his example. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase, what you do speak so loudly I can't hear what you're saying? You ever heard that? That's an expression of someone who does not practice what he preaches. However, in the case of the Apostle Paul, he not only said it, he exemplified it. His life was holy, that is, godly, righteous, marked by integrity, unblameable, not able to find fault with. What an example Paul is for us today. What a walk he walked but what a, and what a talk he talked. I wonder what kind of impression has our lives or have our lives made on other believers? What kind of impression has our life made on unbelievers? Have our lives been exemplary? I'm not, I don't mean perfect now. I mean exemplary. In following you, would a new convert or an unbeliever, would they want to follow Jesus Christ? He speaks of his endurance. He speaks of his example. And then last of all, he speaks of his exhortation. Look at verse number 12 as we close. That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You see, it's not good enough just to support the family by working and to teach the family by example. We must take the time to speak to the family members. As busy as Paul was, he still found time to personally invest in the new believer. Notice what he says. He says, we exhorted. That means we encouraged you to go on with the Lord. He says, we comforted. We were aware of the difficult circumstances. He says, we charged. We testified to you out of our own experience. Do you, do you know one of the things that a father does with his little child? He, he tries to teach that child to walk. Now listen, what did you do when you were teaching your child to walk? When that child fell down, you know what you did? You went and you picked that child up. Paul says, I minister to you that you would walk worthy of God. So here is our ministry model. People in Thessalonica were lost. They were dying. And they were going to hell. Just like many in Pickens County are. Paul knew the only way of escape. Christ and Him crucified. The unsaved needed to be saved. The saved, the new converts, needed to be nurtured. There was no task, there was no calling, there was no obligation more important to Paul than the task of reaching the lost and discipling the saved. As a matter of fact, that's what he gave his life for. I wonder tonight, are we willing to dedicate our life without reserve, to dedicate our life to this same task, winning the lost and discipling the saved. I close with this illustration. Gladys Allward. Gladys Allward, after a lifetime of missionary service in China, she made this statement. She said, I've not done what I wanted to do. I've not eaten what I wanted to eat. I have not worn what I would have chosen. I've lived in houses that I would not have looked at twice. I longed for a husband. I longed for babies. I longed for security and love, but God never gave them. Instead, He left me alone for 17 years with one book, a Chinese Bible. She said, I don't know anything about the latest novels. I know nothing about the latest pictures and theaters. I live in a rather outdated world, and I suppose you would say it's awful miserable, isn't it? She said, friend, I've been one of the happiest women who stepped on this earth. I have known the heavens opening and the blessings tumbling out. I wonder, I wonder, what kind of model for ministry am I as a pastor? What kind of ministry model are you as a believer? What kind of ministry model are we as a church? Are we trying to win the lost to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we following up and discipling those who give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? What about our example? 
What about our endurance? Are we laboring night and day for the gospel? Uh, are we, have we given ourselves, dedicated ourselves without reserve to doing what the Apostle Paul did? God, may it be, or, or church, may it be said of us that we have been found faithful just as a steward. We've been found faithful in these matters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed.